Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 14 through 20 this morning. Uh, as we continue in our Invite Your One series, looking forward to our Back to Church Sunday coming up on October the 6th. We've got a lot of people in our community uh, that uh, don't attend church on a regular basis. And part of what we're trying to do is to encourage you to build relationships with those people. Many of them you know. Some of them live in your home. Some of them in your neighborhoods. Maybe you work with them. Uh, but you kind of pass them day by day, and we're encouraging you to build those relationships, cultivate those relationships. And then on this particular Sunday, which will be more uh, like a, a crusade type event, we're going to encourage you to invite them to come to uh, church with you on that particular day. Uh, they'll be able to hear the gospel message, uh, but also uh, we'll, we'll be able to show them what it looks like to be a part of the family of God. And so we're encouraging you to participate in that. I have my one, I actually am attempting to invite, since I, I go to three services on Sunday morning, so I'm trying to invite a one to each service. Uh, that's my goal. I've got two of them already sort of uh, nailed down. Now, you, whether or not they'll show up or not, I don't have any control over, but uh, they have at least said that they were coming. So uh, still working on the 8 o'clock service. You guys are early birds. So, uh, But uh, we uh, hopefully that's going to be taking place in every one of our services here in Ocala, as well as our Dinellon uh, campus as well. And so we're excited about inviting them to come to church with us to be able to uh, hear about Jesus but also to be able to see the family of God and how the family of God works and how we are able to interact with one another and to be the church. Now listen, I, I, I try to say this every week. Inviting someone to church is not the um, only way and not even really the, the way of evangelism. It gives you the opportunity to be able to encourage them to come and to uh, see you and to be with you and to see what it's like to worship. It's kind of an entry level thing, but it's also a good start. And so we want to encourage you as we've been talking about this whole concept of who's your one to be sharing the gospel with people, to be telling them your testimony, to be living that out, that out in front of them, but to also give you a chance to invite them to come to church with you. I mean, what does it mean to be involved in a local church? Today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We have recently also looked at Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we're reminded uh, that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to our God. And then he's going to go into, in Romans, the whole description of spiritual gifts as well. We looked at that back a few months ago as we were kind of walking through that section of Romans. Paul starts Romans chapter 12, verse 1, by saying, therefore. And whenever you hear the word therefore, it ought, to, it ought to kind of encourage you to look back and see what that word is there for. Something happened before it to encourage you to look back and think about, okay, well, in light of what he just said, in light of chapters 1 through 11, where Paul's been teaching truth, and basically what Paul is saying is if that's true, then this is how we will respond. This is the appropriate way of responding. To worship and then to serve. To worship and then to participate in the body of Christ. He says we are to be living sacrifices. It's an intentional paradox. I mean, how can you be a living sacrifice? Sacrifice implies killing and death. But to be a living sacrifice is to die to yourself over and over again, to give of yourself. You put the, the idea of your own life and your own agenda and your own desires to death, and you choose to live the life you have to someone else. And in this particular case, the most important case, to Jesus. It, interesting, though, if you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and you pay attention to the nouns, the nouns are brothers plural, bodies, plural, but sacrifice is singular. In the context of what he was about to share of the spiritual gifts of the body of Christ, he's asking them to give of themselves, all of them independently, but together to sacrifice. To We aren't out there as individuals serving on by ourselves on an island. The church is a partnership of multiple people making 
this singular sacrifice together in order to accomplish what God has placed us here to accomplish it. No one person can do it by themselves. Not a pastor, not a teacher, not a church member. Groups of leaders can't even do it by themselves. If we want to be successful in our mission, in our witness for Christ, here in Denellen, in our state of Florida, and all around the world, then we have to have that Acts chapter 1 verse 8 mentality where we're going to go and do what he calls us to do. But if we're going to do that, it's going to require two very important things. If we're going to be that kind of church, if we're going to be a greater church than just the status quo, then we're, we're going to have characteristics that kind of indicate and implicate the fact that we're going to be a part of what Christ has called us to, giving ourselves. And so he talks about spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12, but he also does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 20. So I want us to read that together, and then I want us to just kind of look at two very important characteristics of a greater church that's doing what Christ has called us to do. In verse 14 it says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say... Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. And if all were a single member, there would be... Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Two very important characteristics of a greater church on mission for Christ, doing what he has called us to do, and they're simple. I'm going to go ahead and give them to you now, and then we're going to kind of unpack them. First of all, uh, a greater church is a diverse church, but a greater church is also a humble church. So let's look at those just real quick. First of all, if we're going to be a greater church, the church must have diversity. We cannot all be the same thing. You know that. Conceptually, you know that. But practically, that's the way it has to be lived out. We we can't all be the same thing. Now, you're you're probably thinking, well, no, aren't we supposed to all be followers of Christ? And aren't we all supposed to be be obedient servants? And yes, all of that is true, but we, we don't obey Uh, In in every situation, we're not obeying in the exact same way because you've been gifted differently. You've been called differently. You've been given different passions. One of the things, uh, my undergrad is in business, and one of the things that we were trained in in in, uh, the business world was taking those disk analysis. Anybody ever taken a disk analysis? Yeah, okay. Do you know what a, what a, a company, an organization would look like that has all D's? Nobody would get along. Nobody. Because everybody would be domineering. Everybody would be the dominant personality. That doesn't work very well. It doesn't matter which of the the disc analysis that you find yourself falling into. The D, the I, the S, the C. You can't have everybody in the same area. It's exactly the same with spiritual gifts. It's exactly the same with God's calling on our life. Everybody can't lead. Everybody can't follow. Everybody can't be a prophet. Everybody can't have discernment. Everybody, we have to have a diverse congregation. We need many members. That's what he says. The body does not consist of one member, but of many. We're made up of many different members, and those members have different functions. They serve in different capacities. People have asked me at different stages of my ministry, at different churches and different capacities. Well, Pastor, why do we have to grow? Why do we need to grow? Can't we just stay the same size that we are? Well, sure we can. There's certainly nothing, nothing that says we can't do that. The problem with that mentality is there are lost people around us everywhere that God has created and that Jesus has died to redeem, and that God has placed in our heart and in our mouths a message to go and take to them so that we can share with them the truth of God's love and His grace and His mercy through Jesus Christ, that we can then invite them to come to Christ. And 
And when Jesus takes their heart and he transforms their heart, they now become beneficial to the mission of God and to the church of God. And God incorporates them into the body of Christ. And then he builds up the body and brings glory to himself and then continues to reach the lost because of the work that he's doing through the lives of others. Our goal should be that more laborers would be called to the harvest. Not fewer, not that we would stay the way we are, but that we would have many members. And those many members will have many gifts as well. He says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. I, I, you, you say, well, what does that actually mean? You know, I actually encounter people a lot of times in the church that are believers, and, and, and they will give me different excuses. They probably won't talk about it like it's an excuse, but they'll give me different reasons why they can't participate. Well, you know, I'm just not, I'm not good at talking to people. Well, you know, I'm just, I just, I don't have a lot of money. Oh, you know, I just, I'm not really, I'm not really qualified to, to be with a group and I wouldn't really know what to say and I wouldn't know how to act. And he, here's what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is that the God that made you made you the way you are and he gave you certain passions he gave you certain gifts when you came to faith in christ and the holy spirit dwelled within you and what you have is what you need to do what he's called you to do he hasn't called you to do what i'm doing he hasn't called me to do what you're supposed to do but he's called us to do collectively and together what he put us here to do and the truth of the matter is that we need each other and we need each other more than we know that we need each other. And beyond that, we even need the ones that he has yet to bring into this body, that he will bring into this body because of your faithfulness in witnessing and sharing the love and gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. He will use the people that he's going to bring in to build up the body of Christ. Now, now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying... That we will never be what God wants us to be until other people come here. What I'm saying is that God's plan for us will continue to grow as we continue to be obedient to his commands. We continue to do what he's called us to do. He will continue to bring people in and fill needs and roles that we didn't even know there was a void there. But we'll begin to see what God is doing as he begins to do the work in his body. Anybody ever take a music class? You get all of these different people, and, and, and especially with beginner music classes, you get them together and you got people playing flutes and clarinets and violins and trumpets and saxophones, different types of percussions, you know, all these different instruments, brass, woodwinds, all of those things. Have you ever been in a beginning music class when they give them that first kind of introductory piece of music and they kind of show them how to use the instrument. And they tell them this is what you're supposed to do. And then they start to play. It is awful. Man, it is awful. I, I have a flautist at my house right now who's not in beginner band anymore. She's in inter intermediate. But when she was in beginner band and she was starting to play the flute. And she would be in the room and she'd be playing the flute. I literally thought something was dying in the house. I was confident that people, there, there was some type of horrible thing was happening upstairs and we were, we were probably going to be visited by the police pretty soon for some type of just terrible tragedy that was taking place. And, and then she got better. The more she practiced, the better she got. And the, and the coolest thing was when we first went to her first recital, and I had heard all of these individual notes that had been played, and it didn't make any sense to me. I just couldn't work it out in my brain. I couldn't hear what was actually being played. And yet they came together, and in beginner band at their recital, playing some simple but memorable and, and noticeable tunes that we would all recognize, they began to play. And when it came together, even in beginner band, now it makes sense. I could still hear the flute playing all of those weird off-the-wall notes that I'd heard in her bedroom that didn't make any sense by themselves. 
But now all of a sudden I could hear it together with the rest of the band and everybody was playing those weird kind of off-the-wall, non-recognizable notes. But when you put them together, you got to hear tunes from Star Wars. You got to hear tunes from some of the famous shows that we've listened to, some of the famous musicals that we have watched. And, and it, was, it was recognizable and it is even better the more they practice individually they use their craft but when they come together and they practice together now the tunes not only are recognizable now the tunes begin to be harmonious they begin to be beautiful they begin to be something that you want to listen to did you know that's the way the church ought to be as well that we as individual members of this body are exercising our gifts and utilizing what God has placed in our life, and we're working hard to put it into practice, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to Him, coming together in such a way that it doesn't communicate to the world that the church is full of hypocrites and that we don't like each other and that we're just constantly fighting and bickering in the church, but no, it comes together in such a way that there is harmony because we serve one God. There's one Spirit. There's one Word. And he's placed one passion in our heart to honor and glorify him. We have to have diversity for that to work. But here's the thing. If we're going to have diversity, and we're going to be a church made up of, as he says, many members. We're going to have many gifts. Then we're also going to have to have some humility. The church can't just simply be diverse. We're going to have to have humility as well. First of all, you're going to have to have humility to recognize that you need other people. Sometimes we kind of get in the, in the habit, in the sinful habit of thinking that we have everything that we need. That we don't need anybody else. Did you know God made us in such a way that we should be dependent upon him? And that we should be dependent upon the other people that he has put in our life. For encouragement, for accountability, for a variety of different reasons. It's really easy for us to kind of lean on our own abilities. But then when times get tough and our abilities begin to fail us, we can't figure out why God have you forsaken us. Why God have you abandoned us? And that's not what's taking place at all. But if we're, if we're going to be what God wants us to be individually and as a church, we're going to have to have some humility. Verse 17 says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Here, here's how your dependence is so important. Let's say you're a hand. How many of you have seen a singular hand be successful at doing anything by itself? Now, I'm talking about in the real world, not on the Adams family, okay? A singular hand that was successful at accomplishing anything in reality. What about a singular eye? This is, the, this is what he's telling you. This is how he's communicating to you that you have to have the body of Christ. It's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to reach out into our community to not only the lost, but also the believers that are in our community that have gotten trapped in that lie that they don't need the church to grow. This is a very clear communication to us and to other believers who maybe have strayed away from the body of believers, to remind them that apart from the church, you cannot be successful in the life that God has called you to. Where would the body be? But the, isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting how he has stated that? If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose... If we were all single members, where would the body be? So he, does, he gives us two contrasting perspectives. Number one, if, you were, if the whole body were an eye, then we, we wouldn't be able to function properly. 
you wouldn't be able to function properly. And, and that's really what he's trying to communicate. You personally need the church, and, and the church benefits from you being there. Now, the church doesn't depend upon you. You're not the source of the church's power, but you are necessary. Here, here's, here's the humility portion of it. And I've had to deal with this. I've, I've had to face the facts. I, when I left the church that I was at in, in just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, in a little town called Zebulon, North Carolina, we'd had some significant growth in the church. And for you know, several months, as uh, College Road was calling and talking with me, Beth and I, my wife, were discussing the fact that there's no way God would call us away from here right now. Too many good things are going on. And if we leave, how will they ever survive? You know what I found out? Here's how they survived. They called another pastor. And you know what the pastor did? The pastor came in and he led. Every one of us are replaceable. The church doesn't depend upon us. But you are here right now for such a time as this. It just kind of reminds me of the fact that in, in March 1981, I remember reading the story afterwards in a book that I was reading, when Ronald Reagan was shot by John Hinckley uh, Jr. and was hospitalized for several weeks. Did you know that the government of the United States of America continued president was in the hospital, couldn't fulfill his duties, and yet it had very little impact on the nation's activities. Government continued to move on. But in Philadelphia, when the garbage collectors, the waste management people went on strike, that entire city became a literal mess. The pile of decaying trash quickly became a health hazard. A three-week nationwide strike paralyzed the country. Now, who's more important, president or garbage collectors? The answer to that question is they're all important. And it doesn't matter how we elevate the positions. What matters is how do the positions benefit, edify, build up those who are receiving all of the good that comes from those positions. It's the same in the church. It doesn't make any difference. Pastor to the person who's changing diapers in the nursery. All of us serve a function in the body of Christ. All of us have a responsibility to use our gifts and our talents and our passion. And it's not because the church depends upon us. It's because God has placed us here for this time, for this moment, to be a part of what he's doing because ultimately the church must depend upon God. We have to be humble enough to realize that it's not all about us. And, and if we're not here, the church will continue on because of the other people that God has brought into faith in Christ in this body of believers. But here's the truth. There are more people outside of these walls that God has placed us here to reach some of them are believers already and he's calling us to call them in to the body of christ some of them have never heard of jesus and never had anybody sit down and share the gospel with them and he's calling us to go and to tell to go and to share to go and to be his witnesses and ultimately the benefit is for every one of us that god would build us up that god would strengthen us that god would encourage us through the message and through the mission of the other people that we serve right alongside. To have humility to be able to benefit from that diversity. You can't think you know it all. When I was in college, I worked at a church that was about an hour away from the university where I attended. And for the most part, I kind of drove back and forth. I lived close to the church, but I drove back and forth uh, to to college and one particular Sunday evening after church I went ahead and drove to the the university or actually I was driving to a friend's house because I had to be at the school so early on Monday morning I did not want to get up and leave at like 4 30 in the morning I just I'm not really a morning person I want to be a morning person 
I pray hard about it. It just hasn't happened. Now, I can stay up as late as anybody wants to stay up. And that's why I made the decision. I was like, you know, I, I drive at night better than I can drive in the morning. So I'm going to do that. Well, when I got in my car, turned it on, started to drive away, I, I looked down and I noticed that I only had about an eighth of a tank of gas. But I, I just thought, you know, I, I know that I can make it. For, it was about an hour drive. I know I can make it. I've made it before, so I'm just going to kind of push on. So I'm driving down the road, and the whole time I'm driving, after just a few miles, while I'm driving down the road, it starts to beep at me. It starts to warn me that, hey, you got a, you got a fuel issue here. Yeah, but i got plenty of miles left. I know how many miles I have. Then the light pops up, and now it's flashing at me and beeping at me. Then at some point I called Beth, and I was telling her, we weren't, we weren't married yet, but I was, I was telling her, hey, I'm on my way. She was actually in school, and so, uh, hey, I'm on my way back. And she's like, what is that noise? Oh, that's my fuel gauge. It's telling me that I need to get gas. And she was like, well, don't you think you need to get gas? No, I got this. This is no problem. Uh, sounds like you don't have it. It sounds like it's trying to warn you of something. No, I've done this a lot. I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about it. The problem with this whole mentality was the very last stretch of the, the trip, before I got into the city where, my, where the university was, there's this huge hill that you have to climb. And Beth's warning me the whole time. She's like, you know there's, really, there's a stretch of road there where there are no gas stations. And then you got to go up that big hill. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Why are you trying to tell me what to do? I've got this. Then I start going up that hill. And it didn't make any difference how sure I was how confident I was, how many times I'd done it before, as I start to go up that hill, I start to jerk and sputter. Now, I mean, it's a steep hill. Now I'm thinking, not only am I not going to make it up to the top, this thing's about to roll back down to the bottom. But I just managed to cross the top of the hill, and as I got over the top of the hill, it completely turned off. I put it neutral and coasted all the way down the hill. And coasted, thankfully, when I got to the traffic light at the bottom of the hill, there was a green arrow to turn left. And I coasted through that green arrow into the Texaco gas station that was down there. Beth called me and said, hey, did you make it? Oh, yeah, I made it. No problem at all. No issue whatsoever. You know what I could have used? Some humility. You know what I could have realized? I, I could have realized that, hey, Alan, you don't have all the answers. Hey, you're not always right. Hey, sometimes you should listen to other people. Hey, you know God puts people in your life so that you won't just do what you want to do all the time and always think you're right and always look down your noses at other people. And part of the problem in the church is many times we have a group of people that are convinced we've got it all worked out. When really the reality is the only one that has it worked out is God. And the reason why he's put these people in your life is because you need them. And you need to rely upon them. And you need to trust them. And yes, sometimes they'll hurt you. And yes, sometimes they'll let you down. And all the way through every bit of that, God is always with us. He's always gracious. He's always there to pick us up and to be the person that he wants us to be in the lives of these people that he's placed in our life. And here's the reality. There are people outside of the walls of this church that God wants to be a part of this fellowship as well. If we would simply stop looking at our own interests and look out for the interests of others and look out for his glory and encourage and hold each other accountable to do exactly what he has called us to do. Can you sometimes coast into those successful moments almost by accident? Yes, but why would you do that? When God has equipped you and called you and placed you with a body of believers to accomplish a task greater than yourself. You're here for such a time as this. And I hope and pray that we will look back on our life and we will think we did everything we could to take advantage of the opportunities that we had collectively for the glory of God and for the mission of Christ. We did everything we could. I hope that'll be our prayer. I hope that's your prayer this morning. Would you bow with me as we close our service out this morning?